Jenny Mosher, and today I'm talking with Garrick Jones, author of Crime, Historical and LGBTQ Fiction. Join me as we learn about Garrick's work processes and what drives him to write. Good afternoon, Garrick. Thank you for joining me. Uh, thank you, Jenny. Thank you for the invitation. No worries. You're looking all uh, nice and warm there in your uh, in your sweater. Yes, it's a bit cold up here in the tropics. It's 22. It's climbed a degree. Oh, so, so we're all rugged up. I feel for you, mate. <laughs> I feel for you. <laughs> now you've got you've done seven books with us so far, um, and you're working on the eighth. You retired seven years ago. Um, after a career with Australian opera and travelling the world and what have you. Were you thinking of these books while you were working? Did they all come spilling out? Or did you, was it something mm. that you had to close the door on work and then? Well, they actually start, I started writing when I retired because I wanted to read a lot more about um, my own country and mm -hmm. my sort of lifestyle experiences due, uh, during that period. And I couldn't really find anything that wasn't angst for. Right. So a whole lot of stuff about the AIDS crisis and people dying and lots of stuff. But I just wanted to read stuff about normal um, gay people in Australia throughout history, and yeah. I couldn't find much. I know there's a lot more available now, and that's what prompted me to start writing. Yeah. Um, so you're talking about stories about people who happen to be gay. Yes, rather than being yeah. a gay book. A lot of people think that uh, people about gay books about gay people are, are pornographic or sexually orientated, and that's not necessarily the case. No, yeah. no. No, it's the same as, you know, they can have red hair or something. It's yes, just, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. But so, I did have a big background in writing. I did um, two research degrees while I was performing full time. Mm -hmm. And then when I retired from singing in 1999, I was headhunted for the university I lectured at and I lectured in history of the arts and music um, and, of course, did a lot of writing, had to publish papers. It's part of the existence and survival of all academics these days. Yes. And um, I, had a gift, I had a gift for it that I didn't realise that I had. Mm -hmm. So when I retired and I started to write, it came very easily to me. So the gift isn't – you also enjoy that gift. It's not oh, a yeah. gift that yeah, is, a, is a, a weight. It's, a, it's not a burden. No, no, not at all. No. I love it. I love it. I wish I'd started earlier. Yeah. Too many ideas and not enough time, I don't time. think. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me about it. I know that feeling. <laughs> so, so research and history, that would explain, um, I, bet, I was reading one of the stories in Boys from Bullaroo, Boys of Bullaroo, um, a young fellow trying to get into the army, and into the medical corps, I think it was. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I couldn't understand how anybody born, you know, when we were born after the war, how anybody could know enough to know what they don't know to research to have those steps that he had to go through. Yeah, well, look, I was fortunate. We're very, very lucky now that the internet has arrived and the, the major archival of a lot of material that would otherwise be, you know, locked away or perished. Mm -hmm. And I found a manual about um, about that process that a young medical corpsman would have to go through um, from New Zealand. And oh. then... And then I used, I referenced that, referenced that to a few um, quite old diggers who'd been corpsmen during the Second World War, and they explained through a, an online forum, they explained mm -hmm. their experiences, and they're pretty well much the same. So right. just getting that research helps make the story feel real. You get more immersed in the, into what actually what happened, if there's some truth behind it. You do, and I found that yeah, I was enjoying what I was learning. So it wasn't just about the people. It was, yeah. oh, wow, I didn't know that you went through that. Yeah, to, that's, to based do on a tr that's based on a true story too. It's based on the son of one of my neighbours when I was oh. growing up who yeah. died died in Changi during the Second World War. And oh. he was a medical thing. Right. His mother used to talk about him all the time. Poor woman. Yeah. Mm. yeah. She lost that's two sons. So cruel. No. So cruel. Yeah. You, you hear about that and you just think, why it's it's not right it's not no fair. it's not right no. no no oh that explains a lot about um how how your books seem so so real and of course your um your clyde smith stories they're set in sydney in yeah could you in the 50s 60s no 50s 50s no, yeah first yeah. one starts in 56 the second one starts in fifth uh yeah at the end of 1956 yeah right right um you know Coogee well? Well, I grew up in Coogee, between Coogee and the, and the bush, so I do know it very well. 
put you in the bush. Now there's a, there's a, there's, a, there's another title for you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. see my on my um, biography I have from the outback to the opera. So it starts off, you know, because I was brought up by a um, sheep uh, raising family in the right. northwest slopes and plains, and my grandmother, who was the daughter of that family, lived in Coogee. So I spent a lot of time going backwards and forwards between the outback and Sydney. Oh, okay, right, right. Mm. So, so you do, you know a lot of the country. So that yeah. helps. Yeah, that's why I wrote the book uh, The House with a Thousand Stairs, which is basically based in that area using the local Gamilaroi language and tribal customs. Right, so that's set in Queensland? No, 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 it's set in, it's... Um, in New South Wales. New South Wales, sorry. I was reading something, I mean, an editor's, editor's well, I can't even say it, I mean, an okay. editor's group on Facebook and someone was asking the question the other week about stairs and steps and someone noticed that a lot of Queenslanders will call them stairs yes. when they're outside, so, whereas south of the border we call them steps. Regardless. Yeah, so like they call, I, when I grew up, the stairs were something inside the house and steps were something that went up to the back door. Right, right. That's we, what, yeah, that's what we call them. We, we didn't have enough money to have, have steps or stairs inside. They were just outside. <laughs> <laughs> Has a background working in the creative arts and opera helped inspire stories? Oh, yes. Um, Australia's Son, which has probably been one of my most popular books, yeah. is written about the life of a baritone singing in the Opera House in 1902 in Sydney. And right. it's a murder mystery set within the theatre. Mm -hmm. That was an interesting bit of research because when I was trying to find out what was playing in all the theatres in Sydney, and they were, there were dozens and dozens right up until the 1950s. It was easier to find out the tram timetable between Circular Key, Key and Glebe than it was to find out what was playing at the Theatre Royal in the same period. Really? Yeah. Good grief. Yeah, it's amazing. The we're we're terrible, terrible with our artistic heritage in this country. Yeah. That's why I do love legal deposit, and I I've, I've, I've say this all the time. With legal deposit, they go to the National Library, the State Library, there's a copy yeah. There's a copy held so that, yeah, yep. there's something there on the record. Um, your writing process, do you write one book at a time? Are you writing three books at a time? No, one, one book at a time. I, I, it takes me about oh, 12 weeks probably to write the first draft of a a mm -hmm. book which is about 125, 135,000 words. Mm -hmm. Then I usually put it aside for two or three months before I go back to do a revision on it. Yeah. And then after that, it'll go off to an editor. Mm -hmm. um, but at the moment, see, I've got I've, I've got the book with you, the uh, X for Extortion, which is the mm -hmm. book coming out in a few weeks. I'm just finishing off writing the third Clyde Smith story, and I'm sending. Um, uh, Crimean War period spy adventure series thriller to an editor at the beginning of September. But they've all been, you know, sort of backlogged. They're not happening at the same time. Right, it's juggling, not... juggling the processes that happens. Yeah. So, so the, creative, thinking, the creative yeah. period all happens within one space, but then the editing and other things overlap. So with your day-to-day -day writing process, do you do you work? Like do you do five days on, two days off? Do you have like no, a traditional work every, routine? Pretty well every day. Um, yeah. There's one or two days a week where I don't write, where I have other mm. things that go on. But I try to write at least a thousand words a day, and sometimes I get five thousand words done a day. Sometimes I get five hundred. Mm -hmm. It just depends on how the flow goes. And sometimes you can write a whole lot of stuff. And you, at the end of the evening, you go, "God, that's a whole heap of crap." Mm -hmm. And then the next morning, you come back and reread it and go, "Hey, that's not so bad after all." Yeah. Or you well, write you write what you think is really wonderful and the next day you go, My God, and then delete the whole lot. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's a case of finding the nuggets, isn't it? Yeah. Um, so do you actually hold yourself um accountable to say seven thousand words a week? Do you have a do you no, 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 no. I, I keep a um a journal, mm -hmm. a sort of a dot point journal of everything that I do, just that keeps me in touch with where I've been, what I'm doing and everything, so I don't forget stuff. Yeah, um, and it probably gets more important as we get yeah, older. that's true. I try to write um, usable 5,000, when I'm actually writing, about 5,000 words in four days that are usable. Right. That's that's good. Yeah. That's a good idea. Yeah. Yeah, and sometimes more because, uh, as I said, 12 weeks to write 125, 135,000 words, you know, sometimes there's more. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it have to be. Yeah, if you just do the math, it would need to be more, mm. wouldn't it? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So when you when you're writing a book, do you do you plot it out? Do you know how it's going to end before it starts? Do you have to create the ending? What I know the beginning and I know yep. the end, yep. but I and I know a couple of the major points in the way in the middle. But often I've found that when I'm writing, that somehow words come out of your fingers that are beyond your control and they can change the entire direction of the story. Mm -hmm. And so you end up with a better outcome than you had planned initially when you just go with the with the with muse. The yeah, yeah. The, I suppose yeah. it is. There's a lot of people who can't write without plotting everything down and there are people yeah. that they call pantsers. They write by the seat of their pants. And mm -hmm. I've, I'm a plantser. I fall in between the two. So I... <laughs> I keep Bit good of records of all the characters and I make, um, I use one note, try to add a character biog for each of the people as I go along. That's add a good out, idea. Add yeah. out bits and pieces about them as I go. Um, yeah. And especially when you're writing a series, that's really, really important to have some cohesion between the different books in the series. So you're writing about the same person every time. Yeah, yeah. That's a good point because, like, with your, your Clyde Smith mysteries. Yeah. You've got to have consistency with the characters from one book to the next and their backstory. And um, oh yeah, I have quite detailed notes about the brand of cigarettes he smokes. You know, yeah. what the name of his cat, what how he, what he likes to eat, all that sort of stuff. Yeah. So yeah. all of a sudden you don't you don't because people do fans do uh, catch on to these things. You get letters from people saying, you know, what what does he do at night time when he's at home by himself? Mm. And I go, well, he listens to Mama Lena on 2UW and listens to the Italian program and does a bit of cooking and reading and stuff like that. Yeah. So that also helps, you know, you make flesh out the character. Yeah. So they're three-dimensional. Yeah. Actually, now that's, that's another thing. How good are Italian? Oh, I'm fluent. Yes. Yeah. Thought you might be. Um, is that because of the opera, because of the travel? Or? Well, yes, I also studied at university, studied Italian at university, and then, uh, of course, I lived off and on in Italy for nearly 30 years. So Sorry, I, you oh, lived, lived on and off in Italy. Yes. Yeah. So basically I consider myself fluent for a general conversation with anybody in French, German and Italian. Wow. I'm happy but to speak not, English. That's not a gift. That's just, no. you know study but i was also brought up speaking hungarian by pure chance so that bilingualism right at the beginning helped that made, does, made it easier it? Yeah. yeah because you've already been introduced to the concept of, of yeah, another language yeah because that's a hard language i wouldn't want to learn that if i was a non non-speaker at the start it's very hungarian. difficult oh, yeah. very difficult yeah. right right do you remember much of it now can you still use yeah, it yeah i can still listen to under read books in hungarian and listen to the news on the radio if i try to speak it i stumble because i'm not used to forming the concepts the yeah. connections are not there between the brain and the, and the mouth and the lips so much mm. whereas i'm um, italian french and german you know that still works very well it's more automatic yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I suppose if you're going to learn another language, it needs to be like that. It, 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 you need to be able to just switch off the English yes. and just switch on whatever language you're going yeah. to talk in. I wouldn't say that I was ever ever, ever be taken for a, um, a, you know, a, a natural Local. speaker, yeah, yeah, because I've still got an accent and I still mm -hmm. use strange constructions. But, yeah. you know, I can hold a conversation on pretty well anything except sort of some metaphysics or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you're way, way ahead of me on that one. Yeah. Um, you mentioned letters, getting letters. Do you actually get letters from people? Or? Yes, I get lots of that. I'm interested in physical the, letters. Well, I get um, not many snail mail letters, but I get lots and lots of emails. Right. And yeah. among my writing colleagues, my little sort of coterie of fellow writers, I don't know, I think to be, I'm pretty, pretty lucky because I get quite a lot of e emails through my website right. and through Facebook. Yeah. People seem shy these days to leave reviews. They don't want to actually leave an opinion out in public, but they're quite happy to write really nice things in emails to me. That's interesting. Um, why do you think they're shy about leaving reviews? Well, I don't know. I think people just feel that I don't know what I really don't understand it because mm -hmm. there's nothing better for an author for, for even a short review mm -hmm. because that's how all of the big uh, media companies base your visibility yeah. on the amount of public feedback you get. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So even if people leave, you know, three or four stars on Amazon or on Goodreads or something, 
the company recognises that and they push your visibility. But even from a from a potential reader's point of view, if I see reviews, I'll have a look at a few, and I'll and, and it, the reviews will give me an idea of whether I want to read that book or not. Yeah, yeah. And I actually read a really good article once, and they said even a, a two star or one star review is helpful because if it guides you away from a book you're not going to like, then that's good for the author because they only want to sell their book to people who are interested in it. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, I, I get a bit wary about books that have all five-star reviews because I, yes. I wonder about whether that's been... Um, legitimately... Legitimate. But yet I have to say that the, um, the Gilded Madonna, the second Clyde Smith, has only had five-star reviews, so I'm feeling a bit nervous. <laughs> <laughs> I think... I'm pretty sure Amazon has brought in some rules now to make it harder yeah. for people to leave reviews. Yes, yeah, so you, um, you have to have spent a, a certain amount of money over the year be, before you're able to leave a review. It stops yeah. that, you know, people used to pay people to write reviews. That's right, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And I think that's a good thing. And I think you've got to actually purchase it via Amazon so that yep. they know that you have actually bought the book. Yes, that's um, true. And, of course, if you've got a Kindle, they can tell if you've read it or not. Mm. So, um, so yeah, so it's it's actually a good thing. So in a sense, although there may be less reviews, they're probably more trustworthy. I think that's true. I tend to get really long reviews. I mean, almost I think I sent one to you once. It's like a, a short essay. Yeah. I get, you know, get I, there's a number of people who write very, very long reviews on my books, which is very gratifying because mm. within the the criticism is always constructive, but most of the time it's really pretty well glowing. So yeah. people really, really enjoy it. I think because I write in a type of genre that's not very common and it oh. speaks to a lot of people. Yeah. And it, this is not only uh, gay people, it's heterosexual people as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, actually, that's it's interesting because sometimes the long reviews, what I get frustrated with and, and hello reviewers out there, please don't write a synopsis of the book. Yes, that no. doesn't help anyone. That no, doesn't help anyone at all. No, tell people what you enjoyed about the book and even no. let the author know perhaps what you didn't enjoy. But, yeah, don't write a synopsis because the, no. the yeah. It That's gives not a review stories. really because the synopsis is on, on the back of the cover of the book really or yeah. on its description. So In the online description, yeah. exactly, yeah, mm. yeah. Um, so you get emails from fans and I also heard you're doing podcasts. You've been on three podcasts in the US. Yes, I just did another one. On um, it was released yesterday from the uh, Queer Writers Associ of Crime Association in Los Angeles, right. and that just came out yesterday. Uh, a man called Brad, Brad Shreve, who's also a writer, but he has I know a that weekly. Name. Yeah, he does a podcast every week, interviewing. Um, Queer writer, I call it queer writers because it's both men and women, sort of yeah. uh, gay writers uh, who write mystery novels all over the world. Right. And, and I did one on the Gilded Madonna with him mm -hmm. on mm -hmm. Wednesday, I think it was, and it came out last night. Right. And then I have another. That was quick. Yeah, he he he's a really good interviewer. I mean, yeah. you are too, obviously. But he's really. Um, I still have a lot to learn. Yeah, he's a very good interviewer, I and mean, it's an hour long. Uh, uh, interview and he edits really well and he yeah. has um, a, a New York lawyer who reviews a different book at the beginning of each of the podcasts so people listen for the review of, of a book and then they listen to an interview with a, a writer right afterwards right. yeah so, so he uses the same reviewer every 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 podcast. week yeah yeah so that that bloke has to read a book a week, basically. Yes, it's a woman, just Justine Adamac, oh, and she's yeah. a a corporate lawyer in New York, in a woman in her sixties, I suppose. Right. And right. she reads a book a week. Um, wow. Yeah, she's a, she's a, also a great reviewer. She very gets really gets into it. Um, I can't tell you the amount of fun we had when she reviewed the Cricketers' Arms because, uh, an Americans in cricket. I, can't I was going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> that that would have been interesting for her. <laughs> yeah, it was. <laughs> so two Clyde Smiths and two 7th of Decembers, the Sarina's yep. Necklace. Yep. And now we're doing Acts for Extortion. Yes. With the 7th of December, why the 7th of December? Why, why is that a series name? Well, I thought it was a really interesting date because the 7th of December 1941 really changed 
the Second World War because it was the day that Pearl Harbor was bombed by the Japanese oh. and the Americans came into the war. So I thought it would be a unifying theme for the story. So the two male main characters meet on the 7th of December 1940 in oh, London. Yeah. Right. So then that sort of tying together of that date as an anniversary, um, you know, will carry on through the series. Right. Uh, the second book, The Extortion, finishes on the day the book ends on the announcement of the bombing of Pearl Harbour. So yeah. so then the rest of the other, I've got another five books planned, um, two of which have already been written, but I've got to re-look at them again, right. um, which will take us right through to the end of the uh, Second World War. Wow. And war features a lot, that that period and soldiers and the army and, again, this is this must be a research thing for you, is it? Well, it's a life thing. You know, people my age who were mm -hmm. born immediately post-World War were brought up in the shadow of the war. So every yeah. man around us, our fathers, our uncles, our all of their best friends, our grandfathers, that all fought in a major conflict. They fought in the Great War, 1914-18, and then the Second World War, yeah, exactly. and then into Korea. So our lives were surrounded by fighting men, most yeah. of whom were what I call ruined men, men yeah. who came back not able to express what would go on and carrying this terrible burden within them, what they'd seen and done during the war. Mm. So we think about, when you think about it, from 19... The Boys of Bulleroo encapsulated totally because I wrote six stories set a decade apart from the Great War right through the 1960s to the Vietnam War. And each of those decades involved either the aftermath or the presence of a major conflict. Yeah. And it's about the men and their lives spread over that time. So when I was born in 1948, I was brought up with this huge calamity always hovering in the background. Mm. I mean, when we grew up in the in Coogee in the city we still have blackout paper on the windows that weren't take that still hadn't been taken off really? things like yeah so there was wow. reminders all the time my aunt betty who was my it's hard to say her favorite aunt but she was my favorite aunt she was a hat model for curzons in the city during the second world war um, during the day and at night time she was a spotter on the top of the um uh what's the name of the building it used to be on the corner of uh elizabeth street t and g building and she used to spot for uh, with a searchlight looking for planes at night time. Wow. And they lived in Kuji when Sydney was shelled by the Japanese. And there's great stories of the family hiding underneath the kitchen table when, you know, shells yeah. were being fired by Japanese submarines. Wow. Yeah. Um, of course, we wouldn't have had bomb shelters in our gardens. Yes, did, we did. Did we? we did. Yeah, we did. We had one in our, at the bottom of our garden in the block of flats I lived in in Kuji. Really? But, yeah, yeah. Good grief. So was that... So was that for the whole block? Did you? Yes, it was. It was only four flats in the block, but there oh, was. Okay. A, a, I think the shelter only seated about eight or nine. So I don't know what would have happened. That's what I was thinking. I was thinking. You had, know, you... Yeah, no, they had barbed wire on the beaches and stuff, and even and could you? I don't know if it still happens now, but if we had a big storm mm -hmm. and the uh, sea washed away, that you could see in place concrete emplacements under the sand were exposed. I suppose mm -hmm. they've been taken away now, but um, I don't know. Good question. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, the aftermath of stuff like that, they build that infrastructure. Yeah. At what point does it get removed? Yeah. yeah. So that, that, those people did found it very hard to forget, you know, I was yeah. brought up with that make, do and mend philosophy. My grandmother kept every scrap of brown paper she ever had mm -hmm. and every piece of string. And yeah. it was that, that legacy of going without stuff during the Second World War. Yeah. And we yeah. were brought up with it, even though it was supposed to be the big new modern age where we were the age of consumerism, but our parents had had lived through all that and, of course, they had the depression beforehand. Yeah, exactly. Same here. I find it hard to throw out anything. Yeah. Um, and, and now I, I find it very frustrating when you buy things in the supermarket and they're all in plastic. And, sure, the plastic's recyclable, but as we know now, a lot of our recyclables are going to landfill. Yeah, I can tell you this, my grandmother's 1951 Kelvinator fridge yeah. is still puttering away in my garage working perfectly. Is it really? And Good. I can't tell you the number of fridges I've gone through. I thought you were going to say, anyone's. I can't tell you the number of bottles in there. No. <laughs> well, I'm a teetotaler. I don't drink. I'm an odd person. Uh, no, good on you. I um, yeah, I have trouble processing. I think there's something wrong with my liver or my kidneys. 
yes. um, which is a damn shame, you know. I, I was brought up by an alcoholic stepfather. That was the best cure for not yeah. drinking in the world. That'd be good for you. Yeah. Um, so with the opera, sorry, this is off the books thing. Yeah. What's it like performing in opera? You know, it's is, very, is it very hard. It's very, very, very hard work. People have yeah. no idea. It's like it's so physical yeah. that you come off the stage at the end of the evening absolutely exhausted. I mean, yeah. exhilarated usually, but exhausted. Yeah. It's an, an enormous amount of hard work. Yeah. You know, they say it takes any instrumentalist 10 years to master their instrument. It's the same with singing, you yeah. know, and then performing at a professional level is, is a lot of hard work you have to sacrifice a lot of things in your life especially as i was when i was living in europe you never get a chance to be settled in one place for a long amount of time mm. you're always moving around Good you're point. always managing your diet you're making sure that you don't eat or don't speak on the days of performances and you can't yeah. speak on the day of performance well most most singers that are singing big roles don't speak on the day of performances to rest their voice yeah. right right i've heard about you you can't have dairy um, yeah that's pretty bad some people can other people can't yeah. some people say pineapple juice is really good i can't do that that gives me terrible phlegm you right. know we all have our little bits and pieces it's interesting how different bodies process different things yeah. differently, isn't it? It is. Yeah. That's very true. That's yeah. very true. Yeah. So, so you don't miss that? Well, I miss the performance, but I don't miss the business because it's so terribly hard work. It's very easy to get burned out. Yeah. Um, yeah. Do you still you sing only... at all? Are you in any? No, not groups? anymore. No. There's a point where I got to and it started not to sound like I wanted it to sound like, and I thought, oh, this is a better time to stop than listening to my voice deteriorate yeah yeah know when to hold them know when to fold them that's for sure yeah. you know and it's a good you know you need sometimes to stop because you don't want to end up with those people talking about what they used to be because yeah. your career no matter what you do is in a in a memory yes unless yeah. you're a writer or an artist where you actually have a, a tangible mm. um example but music is temporal that happens at the moment over time. So you're the person who remembers your last performance, unless mm -hmm. it was recorded. Yeah. But other people don't. Yeah. And then they hear you again and, oh, yeah, he's not as good as he used to be. Yeah. Yeah. Well, exactly. But oh, somebody uh, linked to me a recording they made for the ABC for Benjamin uh, Britain. No, Benjamin, Arthur Benjamin Opera. Mm -hmm. that I recorded in about 1990 with the Sydney Symphony. And I think back to it and think, geez, that was good. <laughs> <laughs> you forget. Yeah. Well, you that's forget. good. At least you can look back and think, yeah. geez, I was good, not, oh, geez, I was crap. I mean, at least. <laughs> oh, well, sometimes you still think that. Don't worry. Yeah. yeah. As long as it's only you thinking it and not yeah. everybody else. Yeah. Right. So, so a typical day, how many hours a day would you write? Um, I try, if I haven't started writing by 10 or 10.30 in the morning, it's mm -hmm. it's gone. My most creative period is in the morning. So I'm usually sitting at the computer by 9.30 and I write till about 11, then I have a break and then I'll yeah. go back and write for a bit more. Yeah. Then I'll have lunch and a nana nap and then <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll start in the afternoon again and I'll probably write for about another hour in the afternoon oh, or edit. So yeah, so you don't write into the evenings, evenings no, all the time? Uh, by about six o'clock, my mind switches off and mm -hmm. that's when I start to sit down and watch the news or read a book or mm. watch that's a good, movie. You've got, to, you've got to know your limits, haven't yeah. you? But I still keep a notebook next to the TV on which I can write down ideas that come to me good or idea. solutions solutions to problems. Yeah. Um, Clyde Smith in my in my story, his thinking time is lying down in the bath with the shower going, running over his feet with the lights turned off. And he has Ooh. a stool next to the bed, next to the, the bath with a notepad on it. And that's where he does all his major thinking and writes down all the clues to his cases and everything on that. Oh, how lovely. In a day, Back in the day when we didn't worry about water or water restrictions. Yeah, yeah. I know. Yeah. And also in the days when you had a, a gas geezer at the end of the bath, that... Uh, powered the shower you probably don't remember those it was like a gas water heater at the end of the bath that you lit and so you could turn the oh, lights okay. off and all you would see in the room was this frick, flickering blue flame of the gas lighter right like gas geyser right. i remember that very well uh, we had a gas heater out in the laundry yeah uh, and that did for the whole house but yep. um yeah i can remember it, it would go out sometimes and dad would have to go out in the middle of the night <laughs> with a torch and, and light oh. the pilot light up again uh, uh, well, the the bush we had a chip heater we had exactly the same thing except we had to fire it with wood to okay. have your hot water 
Right, right. <laughs> wow. Oh, great. Well, look, this is this has been quite fascinating. Um, yeah, me too. Uh, interesting to talk about this stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so X for Extortions next, and yep. that's a 7th of December story. Yes. And then you've got another 7th of December lined up, or was it another? No, the one after that is, a, is called Servants of the Crown, and that's mm -hmm. about a British, what they used to call intelligencer, a spy. Um, right. In the right at the end of the Crimean War in London in 19, 1855, so there's a big spy story about um, trying to overthrow Queen Victoria, and oh, it's very very complex. I never it's, thought about spies being back then. I think of them oh, as yeah. being. Uh, they were. You think about the Scarlet Pimpernel. You remember the Scarlet Pimpernel? No. No, you don't have. Shame to say, no. Ah, it's no. a great spy story set during the French Revolution. Oh, okay. So 1793, that period. Yeah, I've never. Yeah, I've just never considered that spies. I mean, they probably exist. They would have existed oh, for millennia. Forever. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, the Romans would have dealt with them. The Romans probably had them. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. Right. I just so that, your another, imagination, uh, like just. Well, there's a story behind that one. Um, the British publisher who went out of business, Manifold Press, who used to publish my books, yeah. um, they said, um, would you like to help this young writer? Um, and perhaps you could flesh out an idea and perhaps write a few chapters together. And I said to this young writer, what do you want to write about? He said, I really, really want to write about the, that, this period in London, the end of the Crimean War, mm -hmm. when England was still at war with Russia and there were so many Russian noblemen and people living in London and in France. And of course, um, that's where that idea came from. Right. And that, that was years ago. That was maybe five years ago. Oh, okay. And I just decided to revive the idea yeah. myself and wrote the story. Right. Did he ever get his story published? Do you no, know? no, 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 no. And oh. I, I didn't even use any of that, that what we'd written. I just used the whole I'd concept of the idea of the period. Yeah. And, there's a number of um, very interesting... Queen Victoria was very, very unpopular at that period, mm -hmm. mainly because of Prince Alfred, who everybody believed really wanted to become king and rule the country. Mm -hmm. And so the royal family was very unpopular in the, at the end of the Crimean War. Oh. So I thought it was a really good period to try and get into the social fabric yeah. and also the undercurrents of, of spy networks during that, that period. Yeah. It was also because the period when hospitals started to become modern. Florence Nightingale and yes, yeah, 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 yeah. Where you actually went into hospital with a hope of getting better and coming out again, I suppose. Yeah. And too. chloroform had just been used for the first time. Um, mm -hmm. I think it was eighteen fifty three. So isn't that the drug that can kill you? That's isn't that the thing they hold over yes, the mouth? Yes, but that's also the one that makes you unconscious, so they could actually do what proper operations. Ah, first right. time they used that anaesthetic. Yeah, you right. think they used to cut people's legs off and everything with just a wooden stick between your teeth yeah poor things. <laughs> doesn't bear thinking about does it yeah i know i know it's a case of what's going to kill you the shock or the blood loss yeah. um usually yeah. the shock usually yeah 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 indeed oh thank god for modern modern science huh that's for sure i think we're just about out of time so i'm going to thank you very much for your time well today. thank you for the interview it was very it was great fun yeah um <laughs> i think we've got all around the world and back again but yeah. <laughs> as, <laughs> As I do when I read your stories, talking to you, I've learned a lot. So thank <laughs> okay. you very much. And, um, yeah, good luck with X for Extortion. Thank you, Jenny. Okay. Have a thank good you. one. Thank Thanks, you. Garrick. Bye. You've been listening to an Indie Mosh interview with Garrick Jones. If you'd like to learn more about Garrick or check out some of his books, then visit IndieMosh.com.au or search for Garrick's books at your favourite online retailer. I'm Jenny Mosher. Thanks for listening.